Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Today I think I'm going to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I think I have something to give you that can set you free if you can grasp this. And I think you can. In fact, I know you can. It's something that will help you get through holidays. It'll help you get through birthdays, anniversaries. It'll help you get through family reunions. And here it is. I'm going to tell you right now, this is God's word to you. It is not your responsibility to fix everything in the family. God did not call you to be the family fixer. Now that doesn't mean he's called you to be the family messer upper either. You know, you, you still have to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. You still have to walk in love. You have to walk in joy. You have to walk in peace. You have to walk in gentleness. You need to be a kind person. You need to be an understanding person. And you need to have self-control. I mean, all of these things are, are parts of the, of the fruit of the Spirit, They're just the general attitude that a, that a Christian should walk in. But it's not your responsibility to fix everything and don't receive the guilt that other people try to put on you if you don't fix their problem. Sometimes... People have become so accustomed to you fixing their problems that they don't even attempt to fix the problem. In fact, by them having the problem, they feel brings you closer to them because you're always there to fix it. The word to you today is this. It's not your responsibility to fix everything in your family, in your neighborhood, at the office and don't receive the guilt that other people try to put on you and they will if all of a sudden you quit trying to fix everything or you quit fixing things that you have been fixing for years that you shouldn't be fixing Philippians 4 16 says <clears throat> be anxious for nothing <clears throat> excuse me be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue... And if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Satan wants to derail you from what it is that God has called you to do in your life. Now we have all been called Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. We all have that command. And some people have a command of what we call the fivefold ministry. You've been called to be a pastor, or an evangelist, or a teacher, or something special from God. However, we have all been given a life message. We've all been given a duty from God, whether you're in full-time ministry. Well, the reality is, if you're a Christian, you're in full-time ministry. It never lets up. But whether you're in a ministry, and that's your job also on earth, or if you have a secular job, God has called you to do something. And Satan wants to do everything he can to derail you. And one of the best ways to derail you is distractions. 
And one of the greatest distractions is you trying to fix everything else in everybody else's life. Back off, bucko. Get your hands off of everybody else's problems. The first thing you need to do is you need to fix yourself. A lot of people trying to fix other people are in a worse mess than the people they're trying to fix. <clears throat> you may say, well, I think I've got it together between me and God. Well, that's good. Keep it together between you and God. But God hasn't called you to supervise the world. Satan binds, God releases. Freedom is what God has for you. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, he was talking with his disciples, and he said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There is a freedom in knowing that you are not going to have to pay the price for somebody else's mistake. Because usually, if you're trying to fix somebody else's problem, down the road, it's so that you can have peace, so that you can have freedom. If I could just get my parents straightened out, if I could just get my in-laws straightened out, if I could just get my kids straightened out, if I could, a teacher, at school, if I could just get these students straightened out. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of people out there. There's no shortage of people to straighten out. But there is a shortage of people who are walking confident and free, knowing who they are in Christ. See, you're required to know who you are in Christ. Now, there are responsibilities. There are responsibilities. As a parent, you have certain responsibilities to your kids, and there are, follow me on this, there are certain things you are supposed to fix. Don't take what I'm saying today and take it out of context and, and have the attitude, hey, I'm not supposed to fix anything. No, there are some things you're supposed to fix. There are some things you have authority over. There are some things you're supposed to do, but you are not called to do everything for everybody and all you're doing sometime is, sometimes is enabling them so that they don't have a walk with the Lord because you're trying to walk with the Lord for them. Now, we are to assist. We are to come alongside. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit leads? The Holy Spirit doesn't drag. Hmm. What kind of a life are you living right now? Are you living in bondage? Or are you living in freedom? If you're living in bondage, <clears throat> let me ask you this. It, is this bondage feel like a bunch of ropes that's wrapped around you and you're trying to fix people so that you can be free? Hmm. Have you ever heard the phrase, if mama's happy, everybody's happy? You ever hear that phrase? Nobody's ever heard that phrase. Okay. <clears throat> well, it used to be in my house. And I've heard it on television, so I know that you guys have heard it. If mama's happy, then everyone's happy. You know, that's a sexist statement. The truth is, mama's happy when everybody's happy. Of course everybody's happy when everybody's happy. It's dumb. So what's the point? What are we trying to say? What, what do you do when somebody isn't happy? What do you do with that one person that will not show up at the family reunion? What do you do with that one family that just will not show up at the family reunion? They won't do it. What's your responsibility in all this? Your responsibility is to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, to walk in love, to walk in joy, the joy that God has given you, to be at peace. 
Yeah, but if I, I think if I could just fix them. Do you realize that there are some people you've been trying to fix for 10, 20 years? And they're not fixed? You ever stop to think that there's a possibility that the devil, the enemy, the forces of darkness can be using them to just tie up your time? Over the years, there have been certain people I have refused <clears throat> to counsel with because they would never get free. Now, now follow me on this. You've got to be led by the Spirit on this. But they just want to take your time. All right. And your time is valuable. You only have so much time to be a witness on this earth. You only have so much time to walk in the fruit of the Spirit on this earth, in this body. And the more time the enemy can waste of your time, then the less time you have to let the light shine through you. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify the Father. <clears throat> now, if you've done something wrong or offensive, and that's the reason why this person or family will not come to the family reunion or to the picnic or whatever. If you've done something, then here's the deal. Apologize and ask for forgiveness. And if they receive it, it's fine. But if they don't, don't pick up the guilt. Just let it go and have a good time at the picnic. Eat another hot dog. Eat the slice of cheesecake that they would have had. Show them. <laughs> but the reality is, don't let it mess you up. I mean, we're coming into this big holiday season, and one of the things, I mean, you don't have to be on the Internet very long, and you, you see different families that are having situations how do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? There are some things you need to deal with. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit where you have authority. If you've got a 10-year-old a, a kid at home and something's going on, hey, parent, you have authority there. You need to deal with that. But there are times when you don't have authority because authority has been given to someone else. And that's when you need to understand that you are not God's fixer he can fix through you. Your responsibility is to live the good life of God. And others will see the goodness of God in you. It's the goodness of God that draws the lost. It's the goodness of God that turns people around. As, you know, my second home, Walmart, as, as I attest so often, you can go in there, and there's a thousand things you want to fix. And there's a couple people you want to fix them really good sometimes. But if you walk in love, you'd be amazed how things will change around you automatically when you walk in love. You be who God has called you to be. All right. Now... You are not responsible for people who will not forgive and choose to live in offense. Uh, there's other areas too. When it comes to giving, you are supposed to give. But what about a child or a family member that demands gifts and tries to rule over you? Don't allow the devil to bind you. And certainly do not allow others to bind you and move you by guilt. Guilt is the number one reason for suicides. Guilt. People think, well, they would be better off without me because I. There, there's just a lot of arrows that point toward guilt. 
when it comes to someone taking their life. Sometimes guilt is created by outside circumstances. Sometimes we're, we are bound by physical restrictions and financial restrictions and all that type of stuff. But you cannot allow the things on the outside to affect who you are on the inside. And the amount of a gift, the amount of a gift is irrelevant. I remember one time at Christmas, my dad, he just handed me and my sister each keys to a, a brand new Chevy Suburban, brand new. Just, here's, here's your son, do you want the blue one or the black one? Here, and I, put, I took the black one, and my sister, by default, took the other one. You know, back in the day, they were, I don't know how much a Suburban, a brand new Suburban cost, but that was my dad. And uh, he was very successful, and that was one, one year at Christmas. And that wasn't even the main Christmas gift. <clears throat> was that my favorite Christmas? No. What was my favorite Christmas? If I can get through this. My favorite Christmas was right after Loretta and I got married. I, as a 19-year-old, I collected stamps. I'd always I'd collected two things, baseball cards and stamps. My mom gave away my baseball cards while I was at college. Bless her. <clears throat> <clears throat> but thank goodness I had my stamps with me, Jim. She couldn't give those away. But I needed a new stamp book. And so Loretta told me she was going to get something at the store, and I pulled the car over, and we were, I think we were downtown Bolivar or town, downtown Buffalo, one of those big metropolises. And... So Loretta gets out of the car, and she's in the store for two or three minutes, and then she comes back, and when she comes back, I see her hiding something in her coat. And what she was hiding <coughs> in her coat was a stamp book. Two dollar, a two dollar, a two dollar stamp book. Paperback book, you take your stamps and you put them in there. And when I was thinking a, a few days ago about my happiest Christmas, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I never thought about the Suburban until today. When I was standing here, getting ready to give this illustration, I never thought about the new Suburban my dad gave me, among other gifts. I never thought about that. I thought about that $2 stamp book. Because what you give from the heart, people will remember so don't ever have this thing, well, I just, don't, I just don't have enough money to give people gifts like I'd like to give them. I don't have enough money to give the kids what I want to give them. So I guess they're going to love somebody else because somebody else gives more. No, it doesn't work that way. When you, when you walk down through the corridors of time and then you look back into your memory banks, what you're going to remember are the gifts that were given from the heart even if it's nothing more than a, I don't have anything to give you, but I love you. Are you following me? So don't let people try to control you. Don't try to, I think this is the point right here on this. Don't try to fix things by buying things. Don't try to fix things by having the most expensive Christmas you've ever had. Because then everybody's going to see how much I, I love them. No. No. They're going to see how much you spent. And then in January and February, they're going to be wondering why you're walking around with a wrinkled forehead because MasterCard's calling you on the phone every five minutes saying, where is that stuff? <laughs> Don't be bound by fear. All types of fear. Let me uh, give you a scripture here. Matthew 10, 25. Jesus is talking. <clears throat> he said, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. 
everything basically comes out in the end. And your true motives will be shown. And, uh, you know, the Bible says there's, there's 365 times, and, and several ministers have always said this would make a great devotional book. And I just, to this day, I don't know of anybody that's done it. But there's 365 times, 365 days in a year, 365 times in the Bible it says, do not fear. I think that that by itself should let us know, what, what is it we shouldn't fear? You shouldn't fear what people are going to think. Well, what will they think if I, if I don't get them this? You know, look, if there's three models of an object, one model costs $10, one costs 100 and one costs 500 and you've only got $10 and you want to get them a gift, if you get them the $10 one and they're mad because they didn't get the $500 one, you probably shouldn't have got them anything to begin with. Because people should not be judging how much you love them by how much you spend on them. And you shouldn't be in fear of what they're going to say when they open the gift. If you're truly giving out of love, you just it's your heart that's exposed, not your pocketbook. Yeah, well, I can't help what I think. Yes, you can. You need to get my message on what you think. You can decide what you're going to think and think what you're going to think because your thinker is in your head and nobody has control over your head but you. You say, well, yeah, but you don't know my circumstances. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Your thoughts are under your control and you do not have to have fear. You know how you get rid of fear? Fear and faith are opposites. You want to get rid of fear? Then walk in faith. Because faith will cast out fear because faith only works if love's involved and perfect love casts out fear. If your relationship or your friendship is determined by what you give or by whether or not you fix somebody's problem, then it's pretty shallow. And you probably need to work on your relationship instead of worrying about what kind of gift to get. Don't be bound by guilt. Don't let Satan pull you back into that trap. You say, well, what do I do with these people that just will not, they will not cooperate? I know of one family that there was a wedding in the family. And Loretta and I know of this because we were related to this family. But somebody was getting married, and one whole section of the family wouldn't come to the wedding. Because of a divorce that had taken place 60 years earlier. Nobody that was going to be at the wedding even knew the people who got divorced. Except this one person who was probably in his 80s by then, who if they would have asked him about it would have said, well, I don't know. You know I, and they're allowing problems from decades ago to affect what's going on in their life right now. Here's the deal. They were still, that section of the family was still trying to fix that problem. And you know how they were fixing it? We'll show them. We'll just not show up. I eat their cheesecake. I drink their extra cup of coffee at the reception. You know, here's the whole thing. You, you cannot let those things bother you. Are you following me? You, you cannot let those things and those kind of people bother you. Listen, what was the word from God for this church today? It's not your responsibility to fix everything. There are some things you're supposed to fix. 
But you've got to be led of God and not become so much a fixer that you're trying to fix everything in everybody's life and every part of the family and every part of everybody's family. Because all you'll do is get frustrated. I know that this isn't totally true. But once an idiot, always an idiot. Okay. I know, like I said, I know that's not true. But if Forrest Gump got saved, got born again, what would you have? You would have a saved Forrest Gump. You're not going to have a saved Einstein all of a sudden. You're going to say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're going to have Forrest Gump saved. And a lot of times, the stuff you're trying to fix is not even spiritual. But you're using God as an excuse, and you're saying, if we could just get them saved. Well, you need to get them saved and reformed. And only staying in the Word is going to do that. You can, you can get somebody saved, but they have to have a steady diet of the Word to build faith for their life. If you just get them saved then you've just got somebody saved that's irritating you instead of somebody unsaved that's irritating you. <laughs> you need to get them saved and in the Word, and that's a decision that they make. And that, Follow me on this. That's a decision they make, not a decision you make. You, you can decide you want them to, but they are the ones who have to decide to. Wow, praise God. Hmm. All right, 2 Timothy 2.25, one of my favorite scriptures, and I think I will close with this. <laughs> you know, fear is a funny thing. I got I to I gotta tell you about something. Two things that happened that I really surprised me. In 1992, all the planets were going to line up. Well, they did, actually. All the planets were going to line up. How many of you were alive in 1992? Okay, it was all over the news. It's kind of like Y2K type thing. All the planets were going to line up, and it hadn't happened like a, in like a bazillion years. And so they thought that gravity from all of these planets lining up was going to somehow raise the tide, you know, and uh, that Florida would be underwater, and, and 1992 came and left, and nothing happened. Uh, I am old enough. Uh, Larry Gowdy and I were president and vice president. We alternated back and forth of the Lake of the Ozarks Marine Dealers Association. And there was a time back in the late 60s that Larry and I went to a meeting in Warsaw representing the Lake of the Ozarks Marine Dealers. And they were trying to decide whether or not to build Truman Dam. Are you following me? Now, the Lake of the Ozarks has got 1,300 and some miles of shoreline. Truman Dam was going to go, and, and you can buy the land right down to the 660 water line. Truman Dam was going to be a Corps of Engineers lake. You could not buy the land down to the water line. They were not going to clear out all the trees like they did here at Lake of the Ozarks. You may not know this, but when the Lake of the Ozarks went in, they had lumber crews. I, I think... Uh, Johnny Rodden was part of that. They had, they had back, in 19, back in 1933, they had lumber crews. My grandpa was. My grandpa was. They had lumber crews that came in, and they took out all the trees. They cut down all the trees from the 660 line down. Hauled them out. Cleared it. Well, when they put in Truman Lake, they weren't going to do that. They were just going to back the water up, and it was going to be a flood control lake. And we had this scientist engineer show up at this meeting. And here's what he said. And I was there. I am a witness. He said, if you build Truman Dam, the Lake of the Ozarks, Bagnell Dam, will collapse. And here's why. When Truman Dam fills up and then there's a heavy rain, 
and they have to open all the gates at Truman Dam, it will create a two-foot high wave that will resonate from Warsaw and it will work its way all the way down to Bagnell Dam. And when it hits that old dam down there, Bagnell Dam, when it hits that old structure, it will collapse. Lake of the Ozarks will lose all of its water. And that is what's going to happen. And I can prove it with my drawings. We didn't have internet and like electronics back then. He actually had drawings. And he displayed all of his drawings showing how a Bagnell Dam would collapse. Well, how many of you know it didn't? Well, there were people at that meeting that went home scared spitless. At our next marine dealers meeting, we had people saying, man, we are against that dam. You know, well, how does fear come? <clears throat> fear comes by hearing an evil report. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing a good report. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing the truth of God will build faith in you. If you've got fear, here's how you get rid of the fear. You put in the faith. You cannot have faith and fear at the same time any more than in an airplane. You can be in, going up and down at the same time. You're either going up or you're going down. You cannot be doing both. Does that make sense? Why? Because they're opposites. Faith and fear are exactly the same way. You cannot be doing both. If you are in fear, you are not in faith. And if you are in faith, you are not in fear. All right. 2 Timothy 2.25, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. See that word humility? It doesn't say pointing your finger, talking loud, screaming scripture, and spitting at them. No, in humility. That means you're cordial. You, may, you don't agree with them, but you're cordial. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition if God, perhaps, will grant them repentance. Why are you doing that? So that, here's number one, they'll know the truth. Now let's go to the next verse. Verse 26. So first, so that they'll know the truth. Secondly, what happens when they know the truth? They come to their senses. What happens after they come to their senses? Then they escape the snare of the devil. So that's what you're supposed to do in situations, at family reunions, at places where people are in opposition, and, and you've, maybe you've been trying to fix things all their life. And you may just have to let them know that in humility that you're not going to continue to fix it. That you're not going to continue to be used. And that's what happens a lot of times when you're trying to fix everything, sometimes you're the fool. You're being taken advantage of. Sometimes they know exactly what they're doing, and they will over and over and over say, okay, this time, okay, this time, okay, this time, and it will never quit. Nothing's good. Look, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to continue to have what you've always had, and nothing's going to change until something changes. And what needs to change is you've got to quit being an enabler, quit thinking that you've got to fix everything in everybody, be led by the Holy Spirit, fix what you're responsible for, fix yourself, fix the things that you know that you're supposed to fix, but the things that are outside of that and people are using you and taking advantage of you, it's time you draw a line and realize it's not your responsibility to fix everything in everybody. And your life will be a whole lot happier and you can go to the family reunion and eat that extra piece of cheesecake knowing it's their choice that they didn't come and eat it. And don't let guilt get on you and say, well, if I would have just called them one more time. You know what? I was just thinking the other day. I know they haven't come to this reunion for the last nine years. But I was just thinking the other day. Maybe this time. Well, you'll just maybe this time yourself all the way till you're 99 years old. Because the reality is, if it hasn't worked so far, it's not going to work anymore. 
maybe it's time that you stop enabling so that they can stand on their own feet. Maybe the reason they're not standing up on their own feet is because you're, you keep going around trying to prop them up. Well, do you guys still love me? All right. If your relationship or friendship is determined by what you give, it is a shallow relationship. Pray for your enemies. You still pray for them. You quit speaking evil of them. Quit talking about what they should do. See, that's something else too. Quit talking about what they should do. Well, if they would just, hey, quit trying to fix it. You say, well, I'm not doing anything. No, but you're trying to fix it in your head. Now, follow me on this. You're trying to fix it in your head. You, you got to physically not fix it. Now you got to mentally not fix it. My granddaughter, Carissa, very, very intelligent girl. She's in, in college right now, highly intelligent. And uh, I was taking her, her home one, one evening after uh, a meeting here at the church. I picked her up at college, and I was taking her home. And I asked her a question about something. She said, I'd really rather not talk about that right now. I said, well, how come? She said, and she thinks of her brain as a hard drive like in a computer. She said, I've been studying for that final exam, and my brain's full. And she said, I'm concerned if you put anything else in my brain, I might forget something that, you know, I, I'm going to have to delete something in order to put. So we just sat quietly all the way home. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way I feel right now. I think I've filled up your brains. I have more, but I don't think it's for now. I think you understand that. Say this. It is not my responsibility, not my responsibility. to fix everything. It is not my responsibility to fix everybody. If I go and they don't, it's okay to eat their cheesecake. All right, let's stand. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We thank you, Father, that your word contains wisdom for our everyday lives. That not only does it give us wisdom on our relationship with you, but it gives us wisdom on our relationship with others and how that affects our relationship with you. I speak your blessing upon this congregation. I thank you for the anointing that is upon them. I speak the blessing multiplied upon them. I speak safety into their lives. I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every person as they travel or even stay in their home this holiday season. Once again, a double blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen.